Hei, tēnā koutou katoa. E mihi ana ki a koutou, kua tai mai ki te tautoko tēnei kaupapa. No mai haere mai ki te tai ohanga, ko Dominic Stevens tōku ingoa. Um, welcome everybody, it's wonderful to see everybody online for this final event in our um, more than a year long wellbeing seminar series. Where we plan to discuss what's next for understanding wellbeing in Aotearoa. I'm Dominic Stevens, Chief Economist at the Treasury, and um, really looking forward to hearing perspectives of our four eminent panellists today, as well as perspectives and questions from, from those who've joined us online. So you're hopefully aware that the Treasury um, is really proud to have published its first wellbeing report, Te Tai Wai Order, in November 2022. So th that report gave a high level overview of wellbeing in Aotearoa, New Zealand, both past um, present and a look at the sustainability perhaps of future well-being. Alongside um, writing the report we ran a seminar series um, over the whole of, of 2022 and into 2023 um, just to continue engagement across the across the community on themes emerging from the report. Um, now the discussion on, on well-being of course is going to continue it will be ongoing but this today will be the last in our in our seminar series or, or the Treasury Guest Lecture series, um, the new theme starting from next month is going to be productivity in a changing in a changing world. Um, so today's seminar provides an opportunity to look back at some of the themes we heard through the seminar series, but we also really want to look forward, and that's really what we're looking forward is, for is that forward look as to what further work is most important to enhance our understanding of well-being in Aotearoa. Um, some of that work will be undertaken at the Treasury, but a lot of deep expertise lies outside the Treasury, and we're really looking forward to hearing about relevant research or analysis that you're doing, um, and I certainly encourage you to reflect on what you hear today um, and perhaps get in touch with, with ideas going forward. Okay, so before we start, I should um, introduce our, our panelists today. Um, we've got Tracy McIntosh. Um, Tracy is Naituhoi and is Professor of Indigenous Studies and co-head of Te Wānanga o Waipapa, the School of Māori Studies and Pacific Studies at the University of Auckland. Tracy is Chief Science Advisor for the Ministry of Social Development and a Commissioner of Te Kahui Tā Tariture, Criminal Cases Review Commission. Uh, Next panellist is Gail Pachenko. Gail is a Professor of Economics and a Director of the New Zealand Work Research Institute at, at AUT. She's an experienced researcher with a focus on labour and health research themes and was a Commissioner at the New Zealand Productivity Commission from 2019 to 2022. Welcome, Gail. Um, next panellist is Arthur Grimes. Arthur is a Professor of Wellbeing and Public Policy at Victoria University of Wellington School of Government and Senior Fellow at Motu Economics and, and Public Policy Research. He co-chairs co the World Wellbeing Panel and is a former Chairman and Chief Economist of the Reserve Bank of New Zealand. And final panellist is Les Oxley. Les is Professor in Economics at the University of Waikato's Management School, Adjunct Professor at Curtin University and an affiliate at Motu. He's currently engaged in research on the circular economy and sustainable economic development, the effects of COVID-19 on financial markets and the effects of colonisation on the well-being of all New Zealanders. So again, really warm welcome um, to our panelists. Uh, the way we're going to run the theme, the, the the session today is to break the session into three themes: um, uh, past well-being, distribution of well-being, and future well-being. We're going to get all four panelists actually to to talk to the first um, of those two themes, and then we'll get a couple of panelists to talk to to the subsequent two. And and look at the end of each of the three themes, we'll have time to take Q and A. Um, to take questions through the Q&A function, um, which, which you have there. Okay, so um, our first theme is a discussion around the priorities for better understanding the current state of well-being in New Zealand. Um, Te Tai Wai Order highlight, highlighted, I think that actually the key point from Te Tai Wai Order is that in many ways New Zealand well-being is strong and has improved over the last 20 years. However, we did identify three important areas of low or deteriorating well-being, uh, increasing rates of psychological distress, worsening educational outcomes, 
and high cost slash low quality housing. In particular, we highlighted that young people are, are particularly affected by these three areas of low or deteriorating well-being and tend to have lower well-being anyway across quite a wide range of domains. We really emphasise this, this gap between younger and older New Zealanders. Um, across the seminar series, we heard from the likes of Carrie Exton um, about how COVID-19 has exacerbated some of these challenges, which are being felt internationally. Nancy Hay from the UK What Works Centre for Wellbeing emphasised the importance of um, filling gaps in our evidence base to inform the interconnections between, um, between some of these wellbeing deficits, if you like. And certainly, um, one of the priority areas that Te Tai Wai Order identified for filling these gaps is more analysis of the causal relationships that affect well-being, um, particularly in those areas of mental health, education and housing. Okay, so so we're yeah we're interested in understanding or how to better understand the, the current state of well-being in New Zealand. What I've asked each of the four panelists to do is to speak for for five minutes um, on the following questions. Um, what do you see as the priorities for improving well-being in New Zealand? And what are the key research questions and methodologies that might provide new insights? Um, each panellist has got a sort of maximum of five minutes, so there will be a, a sort of a little chime that everybody will be able to hear it um, to give you a warning that, that there's one minute left in your, in your, um, in your allotted uh, time, time slot. Okay, so um, I'm going to select panellists um, based on left to right on my screen, and that's uh, Gail is um, top left on my screen. So I'll, I'll ask Gail to um, to perhaps um, go first, uh, give us your answer to these questions, and, um, and then I'll, I'll follow up with the other three panellists. Gail. Cool, thank you so much, Dominic, and thanks so much uh, to Treasury for the invitation to be here today. Um, in terms of your first question around the priorities for well improving wellbeing in New Zealand, I thought I'd start by saying something really, really simple. So it's quite good that I'm first to say it in some ways because it's a really simple thing to set the tone in that there's two ways of raising well-being, right? Either we, uh, and they're not mutually exclusive, you either grow the pie bigger or you cut up the pie differently and or cut up the pie differently. Um, so growing the pie, really, really important. It's well documented that incomes in New Zealand are low. So is our productivity growth. And I think it was illustrated in one of the um, background papers for the Treasury Wellbeing Report when doing international comparisons relative to other OECD countries and looking at um, trends in household income over the last two decades. So raising incomes, raising productivity growth, uh, a clear priority for New Zealand. And this requires investment in people, uh, ideas, processes, so that we can create uh, new and improved products and services and new and improved ways of providing them. Um, and this will include things like greater investment in R&D, greater adoption of technology. Many of the things I said throughout my time and continue to say uh, post my time at the Productivity Commission. Um, and I think it's even worth highlighting this a bit more because it's a priority given that we've got structural shifts in the demographic landscape globally. You know, you've got aging population in many economies, reduced working age population, and much greater global competition for migrant workers as well. So that's kind of what I thought I'd touch on productivity as one of the key areas for uh, uh, improving well-being. In terms of your second question, uh, the key research questions and methodologies that will give us new insights, um, I'd personally like to see a lot more research questions that focus on distributional issues. They're often the second question that I get asked in many research endeavors. I'd also like to see more research questions that explicitly examine trade-offs and not just concurrent trade-offs. We often see things being discussed in terms of what's gonna happen in the, in the short term rather than thinking kind of long-term, longitudinally, intragenerationally or intergenerationally as well. And in terms of methodologies, uh, well, we know we have good data in New Zealand or good micro data on individuals, households, businesses, and these can be used and, and we use them to great effect. But I'm also a big believer in the combination of quantitative and qualitative. Okay, which is really easy thing to say, 
uh, but a really tough thing to do. Uh, but if you do it really well, it gives a rich evidence base. So I thought I'd give one quick example on that. Um, we're doing some work at the moment on childhood immunization and what happened uh, with childhood immunization over the COVID period. These are for your routine immunizations and the ongoing effects post COVID. And the micro data tells us, you know, month by month, which population groups had lower uptake, for which milestone event, what were the interrelationships with other data sources, uh, what are the characteristics of the parent or the household that missed out or delayed or did their immunization on time. And then we're complementing that with information on the qualitative, which gives us really nuanced explanation as to the why, because we found, for example, when looking at Māori, that there were some positives. So they felt a greater sense of autonomy in decision making. They felt they had greater choice in making a decision about their childhood immunizations. But then at the same time, they were then swayed by a range of different sources of information. So you need both of those things to kind of complement each other uh, in terms of answering your research questions. Um, and I think I'll leave it there. Hopefully I've done it within my five minutes. Thank you very much, Gail. And, and yes, that was within the five minutes. I think I heard the chime just um, just before you finished there. Thanks very much. Um, next on my screen is Les. Kia ora, everyone. Uh, thank you for, for inviting me here. I'd just like to remind everyone, uh, following Gail's uh, emphasis on, on income, that it's 300 years uh, this year that um, Adam Smith was born and his emphasis on wealth. And I think what was um, useful to read from uh, many of the Treasury reports is the sort of emphasis on, on, on wealth as an element in well-being um, in terms of measurement and in terms of sustainability. Um, the sort of things that I think are, are, are important are, to some extent, um, things that have been said before, health, health and education. Um, and... Um, one thing that um, has, has really um, occurred to me as I've been working through my work on sustainable uh, development over long time periods is the importance of, of inequality, but also the gains that you get through uh, health related increases in well-being, which are often quite difficult to monetize, but are very obvious to see in terms of qualitative measures of life expectancy and infant mortality. But I think what we're finding in many developed economies is that life expectancy may be increasing, but morbidity is increasing at the same rate. So that it's very difficult to actually work out what the combined effects are in terms of well-being. And one of the groups that is, I think, often neglected in terms of our um, discussions and emphasis on inequality are older people who uh, certainly don't have the advocacy uh, both politically or um, in, a, in, a, in a pure ministry sense compared to uh, children and families, young families. And I think that we uh, have a, a paucity of real um, quantitative evidence on what are the effects on well-being of the aged. Um, so in terms of uh, um, health and education, Yes, they, they are, if you like, quite big bangs for the buck, but also the inequality differs between different um, groups here. In terms of um, um, improving well-being, well, I, I think that um, Gail has, has certainly pointed to um, issues of inequality, but I think also um, Gail also emphasised sort of growing the pot and um, I, I think growing the pot is, is important, but it also has to be looked at in, re, in relation to the sustainability over time of well-being, whereas the, our GDP pot is a, is a cross-section where really what we're looking at here and, and why wealth is important is the role of, of the, the, the capitals, the four capitals in these comprehensive measures of wealth. Um, and, and there... Um, focusing on the long-term sustainability of well-being, I think, is is something that we we need to ensure that we uh, focus on uh, 
uh, and um, that will come in part with more of these reports, but also I think methodologically we need to have an intertemporal view of this and an intertemporal modeling approach to sustaining well-being over time. What are the research questions and methodologies? One thing that I've been doing and working on over the last few years is working more closely with Maori and Maori scholars on trying to understand both what um, what well-being is about, but also understanding um, what, what Maori have to say about intertemporal issues and intertemporal elements uh, um, and the environment are clearly a, a very strong focus of, of Maori. Uh, and um, there I think we can learn a lot. And uh, I've heard my one minute ping. So I'll simply just say that I think the future research agendas have to more um, um, uh, I was going to say appropriately address the treaty, but I think more um, uh, um, honestly uh, respect the treaty in terms of working together uh, moving forward. Thank you very much, Les. Um, really appreciate those words. Um, OK, so next on my screen is Tracy. Um, Tracy, if we could get you to give five minutes on what do you see as the priorities for improving well-being in New Zealand and what are the key research questions and methodologies that might provide new insights? Tracy. Um, and it is, look, it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. But I really sort of thinking if I, if we're thinking about well, well-being and wellness, and we have to recognise it has these individual and collective components. Uh, I think that the focus on collective dimensions, collective well-being, is where we're most likely to produce enduring, sustainable well-being. You know, as Les was talking about, in Te Māori, as elsewhere, to be well individually or collectively, the land and the water must be well. So I think that these recognising the incredible overlap of these different types of, of dimensions. So actively responding to climate change at a global, at a national, at a regional and a local le level, informed by evidence, by policy, by practice, by community knowledge and intelligence, um, you know, is and will be critical to enduring well-being. So that material, social, uh, cultural, socioeconomic, psychological and bodily dimensions of well-being, I think also need to take into consideration uh, wairuatanga, that is a spiritual dimension, however broadly understood. And, and I do just want to, to recognise here that often as soon as, particularly as uh, if, if Māori start to talk about this, the wider and the spiritual dimension, there is sort of a concern that we're moving into some sort of mythopoetic space. But actually just recognising when we look at what those indicators are telling about mental well-being, about psychological well-being, that we can recognise that there's elements that are in our society that are injurious to people and that 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 is in a, and that manifests in a, in a whole range of different ways. I think if we're going to demonstrate well-being, we can demonstrate it in a range of ways. And one of the things is sort of to think about the lexicon that we use around well-being um, at the moment. And often there's sort of a well-being and resilience. And I think we, we've got to sort of think about resilience both in positive frames and in negative frames. So one way that we could sort of demonstrate well-being is when we face life collectively, life's shocks and, and nature's shocks, if resilience is understood as growth, recovery and restoration. Rather than I think that we often talk about resilient communities that are that are characterized by scarcity and deprivation, and they say but they're resilient. That's an ongoing survival strategy to accommodate scarcity of resources and a tolerance at an institutional level, at a at a much collective level of cumulative disadvantage. So I think that we have to recognize those elements. And I'm happy to talk about that a little bit more in the distributional um, section. In terms of the re research questions, there are many. Uh, one that I think that's really significant, already been noted by the, the, the first two speakers, how can we disrupt the intergenerational transfer of social inequalities? What are the levers that we need to be in play? And how do we go beyond identification 
So I think there's been a huge amount of research which has identified a whole range of the um, the drivers for inequality, the barriers to, to equity, but there's also a normalization of that. There's a normalization that in any society you have burdens and rewards and that the burdens are going to be largely borne by the same uh, sectors and groups of people. So how do you also get beyond in your research questions around the normalization of, uh, of embedded inequity? So I think that, you know, in terms of the methodology, so, you know, I've already heard it in regards to, and I'll talk about in the distributional element a bit more, uh, definitely we need far more sort of disaggregated data, far more looking at um, subgroup analysis. Uh, and I will be talking, uh, I, this morning I was presenting at growing up in New Zealand's uh, Now We Are 12 uh, launch for the, the, some of their uh, snapshot findings. And I think there's some really interesting elements. You know, Les talked about the elderly. It's an area, you know, our kaumata, our queer, is so important to us. And also recognition that child poverty, you know, when you look at child poverty rates and elderly poverty rates, we recognise that those, you know, that you need to have that intersectional dimension to really understand those that actually can are leading very productive, wonderful uh, elder lives and those that are not. And the same for our tamariki and, and rangatahi. So I'll finish, I'll finish there. Kia ora Tracy, thanks very much. Um, and so our last panelist, um, Arthur Grimes. Arthur. Kia ora Tato, uh, thank you Dom Dominic. Um, the, the first question is a very difficult one to answer. Uh, <coughs> Te Tai Waiora highlighted three areas, mental wellbeing, housing, education. I don't disagree that those are all very important areas for improving wellbeing, but in the end, um, each New Zealander will have different priorities for what's important in terms of well-being, and it's not really up to somebody in sort of, you know, an, an elite position um, to say what's going to be important for to improve well-being for New Zealanders, because that's going to be down to the level of New Zealanders, um, and uh, they'll also have, they'll have different priorities about what's important to improve their well-being and the well-being of the people around them, uh, however they want to define that that net of people around them. Uh, and that's the um, issue I think that we need to think about in terms of methodologies, <clears throat> in terms of thinking about uh, improving well-being. Um, interestingly, Treasury has two different methodologies at the moment, I guess, the Living Standards Framework, uh, which is uh, a, a broad sort of a, a set of indicators and relationships between, between things that are aspects of well-being. And then it has the uh, CBAX uh, approach, the cost benefit analysis module, uh, which um, embeds well-being into it. And uh, I would argue that if we want to think about what's important for improving well-being, then we should be using the CBAX uh, model rather than the living standards framework. The living standards framework is just an indicate, bunch of indicators. Uh, it doesn't tell us anything about well-being in terms of what's, what's really important for people's well-being. CBAX, on the other hand, has uh, incorporates the concept of well-bees, which are well-being years, uh, which have been um, used uh, like quality adjusted life years and health to say, OK, well, when we look at what people value in terms of what's important for well-being for their own lives, uh, we can actually start looking at what are the benefits for people's well-being, how long does it last for, uh, and also, of course, what are the costs in doing so. So we have a very good methodology already embedded within Treasury, but it's not the one that Treasury talks about, which is the Living Standards Framework. It's actually the CBAX approach, which explicitly incorporates well-being years. Um, so how do we go about using this? Well, um, because uh, we live in a democracy, ultimately the elected representatives decide on our behalf um, whose well-being we should prioritise. Um, you know, we can all improve everybody's, you know, we could improve each person's well-being, uh, but often at the expense of, of someone else. Uh, so we do have to go with, with a democracy that, that they will choose whose well-being is important. And then we have to do the research to say, OK, what do those people consider most important for improving their well-being? It's not for the elites to decide that well, we think everyone should go on to tertiary education or everyone should um, you know, get a, a certain level of housing or, or something like that if that's not important for those people. Uh, so once we know who we're trying to target, we need to then do the research at the bottom up level saying, OK, what does the data tell us in terms of what those people say is important for their well-being? Uh, and that may be very different for different sections of the population. 
Um, and then, of course, we've got to understand how we can intervene cost effectively to, to improve those, those aspects. Uh, and that's where we bring it all together in, in CBEX. We'd be using wellbeing years in terms of um, payoffs, and we'd be using the costs clearly because resources are scarce. Now then, when it comes to policy, um, what I think we do need are time-bound targets with accountabilities for those things that we think are important. And without that, it's all just fluff. Um, and if I can compare the last five years with the preceding, say, six years or so, um, we've basically had fluff for the last five years, except for the child poverty targets, which are explicit and, and extremely useful. Um, but all the other targets that were there before had been got rid of. The better public services approach was actually a much more explicit um, well-being approach than the current approach. It said these are the things that we think are important for well-being, um, reducing rheumatic fever, improving um, rates of uh, you know, passing NCA2, blah, 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 all these things. They're explicit targets. They've got times when they have to be achieved by because we think that that's important. And then ministers are held accountable for achieving those. Um, I think if you want a methodology for, for improving well-being, uh, you couldn't really do much better than supplementing the CBAX uh, model with the well-being approach with the targets that were used in the better public services approach. I think that was a much clearer and more explicit well-being approach than what we've had um, in recent years. I'll leave it at that. Oh, actually, I could just make the point. Joe Stiglitz also um, argued in his very good commentary that we should have perhaps six to eight targets, not 60 indicators. Six to eight targets sounds very similar to the better public services targets. I'll leave it at that. Kia ora, Arthur. Thanks very much. So we've had really quite a range of, of different emphases there from sort of growing the pot to intertemporal view of well-being to um, how do we disrupt intergenerational transfer of inequality to an emphasis on um, on individuals identifying what's important for for their own well-being. So quite a quite a range of topics. Um, I'm really pleased with that. Um, so I just invite everybody online, uh, or anybody online, sorry, um, it'd be tough if it was everybody, uh, to use the, the Q&A function, which you'll find at the top of your Teams screen. You can open that. There's a there's a section there that invites you to ask a question. Um, we've got a team sort of moderating the questions. Um, I'll ask them and we'll get one or maybe two, two panelists to answer um, each one. Um, the first question, um, is to Les. So kia ora Les and others. You mentioned our ageing population. How significant do you think the impact of the ageing population is on, uh, how, how significant will you think the impact of the ageing population be on labour force participation? Uh, it's probably better to go to Gail, but uh, what I'll say here is that there, there are a, a, a range of um, aged um, characteristics um, what we what we're finding is that there are those who can be um, can be wealthy in retirement and those that are not and those that are not are suffering um, quite different sorts of health related uh, issues and to make this uh, pretty concrete uh, dental care in aged is is a major issue <laughs> And uh, access to free dental care for the aged is something that would make quite a significant difference to, to well-being. Um, when it comes to those who are able to continue to work, then, then age is much less of a, 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 a characteristic. So simple um, chronological age is not the issue here. Uh, it's whether they're still in the um, working population as such. Um, but in, in terms of um, supporting the aged, then we, we clearly have a distribution of um, those in the working population as an issue. Thanks, Liz. And I think, Gail, did you did you want to make a brief comment as well? Yeah, I was just going to make a comment slightly differently, but it depends on what the question was actually uh, asking about there. So I, I think it might have been on the point I made around that the demographic landscape's sort of changing globally, uh, and we need to be conscious of that where many of our, and, and there's greater competition for workers as well. So while there are some, a lot of areas where there is aging population, uh, where we may have got, where migrants may have come from New Zealand, there's still some areas of the uh, world where there is uh, growth in the population and strong growth, like Southeast Asia, India, as well as Africa. Uh, but it's about, you know, where, 
where do we want where are we looking for migrants what does our skill pipeline look like is it about where we're locating production activity, et cetera. So those are just some things to think about in terms of the global landscape uh, of the workforce, not just the New Zealand landscape. Thank you, Gail. Thank you, Les. Um, the next question I think is is one for Arthur um, and, and concerns sort of tyranny of the majority. So Democrat, democratic um, direction of whose well-being is prioritised might systematically disadvantage minority groups who simply don't have the numbers to be electorally ineffective. Um, are there any approaches available which can possibly address this tyranny of the majority uh, issue in, in democracy, Arthur? Yeah, that's a great, great question. Good because, you know, we do live in a democracy. We have to go with what um, the um, with what the representatives uh, give us. But I think when people are actually well informed, uh, they tend to take much more account of the circumstances of other people. And I don't just mean informing by you know media or social media, or whatever. Uh, I think the most promising route that we've seen in other democracies and in New Zealand more recently um, are citizens' assemblies, where you, you have a, a particular problem, you draw people essentially randomly, but then on a you know stratified, randomised basis so that it's representative of the population um, to consider it. And, and Koi Tu has just run a fantastic one on Auckland's water, for instance, uh, which included Maori perspectives on, on water. Um, you then get experts and uh, others, you know, addressing that, cultural experts as well as technical experts, etc., addressing that. And you then see where, where people coalesce in terms of solutions. And I think if, if you use those sorts of techniques, so Ireland used it for the abortion debate, for instance, and um, uh, got through sort of what was hundreds of years of uh, change um, in, in, in a short space of time. Um, I, I think that that's really the, the best solution that we can you know, hope for, and we should really be putting resources into that. Thanks very much, Arthur. Um, now, I don't, I don't have, uh, oh yes. So another question for Arthur. Um, the CBAX tool requires a good degree of technical ability to use. Um, would this act to institutionalise wellbeing expertise in the hands of a few who are not really connected to local communities' um, own understanding of their wellbeing? Um, it's a spreadsheet. It's not that difficult to use, but it's. Uh, um, it's uh, but no, the, the important thing about CBEX is not actually the tool itself. It's it's the it's what feeds into the tool. So when we're calculating wellbeing years, etc., we're then having to go around and finding out what different communities actually think are important uh, for their wellbeing and and feeding that into the module and in, in, into the model. In the end, it's just feeding it into a spreadsheet. But the the really important comes part comes doing the research, saying okay, uh, with uh, Leah Haynes, for instance, who um, published a paper with. We looked at what's important, most important for the well-being of um, mothers who are in material hardship, mothers with young children who are in material hardship. What's most important for them? It turned out, for instance, that employment, which is incredibly important for many people, for, for, for men in particular, as we know in the research, um, being employed was not important for well-being of mothers with children who are in, in hardship once you take away the income aspect of being in employment because they're already stressed and looking after kids and doing things the last thing they want is to be driven out to have to take up a job as well as all their other unpaid household responsibilities so that sort of showed that um the what's important for the well-being of that group was incredibly different to the well-being of people we often think about which are often sort of white males thanks arthur um i think i'll, I'll round out this one with a question for tracy um i really was quite quite interested in the disrupt uh, intergenerational transfer of, of inequality. And it's something that we looked at really closely in the um, in the wellbeing report. Um, what we looked at, it was sort of where New Zealand, how New Zealand compares to other jurisdictions. But Tracy, I was, I was wondering, are there any jurisdictions or, or um, um, examples Operating around the world, or, or 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 anywhere that you would that you would point to as um, that have been more successful than New Zealand in, in in at interrupting the intergenerational transfer of inequality. Well, there's certainly a lot of places in the world that have uh, you know you know, and you saw that in the comparators that you were doing that have better outcomes across different things, and it may be in education out education outcomes, it may be in health outcomes, it may be in a range of things. Arthur's you know has already made the point that there's there's a whole range of you have to understand context. 
uh, within those sorts of spaces. So we have to have, con you know, I don't believe you can have transformation without context. And I think that often what gets gets left out in these sorts of discussions is the sort of things around the types of concept. You know, when you're looking at about cumulative disadvantage, it's structural. So I would talk about, you know, so I think places that jurisdictions that perhaps work better on these things take very seriously, you know, uh, addressing the issue of systemic frustration of aspirations, what's often given as the definition for structural violence and for systemic you know, failure, the systemic frustration of aspirations. So if we think that in, in the Aotearoa context around what are the embedded elements that constantly thwart the aspirations of particular sectors in the community, uh, you know, Les has talked about, you know, some of that work, or, you know, doing that work around the, colonization not as a as a as a past fact but as an ongoing process that that leads into that cumulative disadvantage so i think that we can point to and we do in terms of looking at different spaces in scandinavia and others but my issue there is that they have a very different type of resource structure they've got a very different type of mineral approach it's got a whole lot of and they've got a different history and context I do think one really important element that we really saw, particularly post-war in Scandinavian countries, was a, a, a decision about really looking at social inequities and a decision about nearly at a bipartisan level about what you would do. And I think that, you know, you see the ongoing uh, ramifications of that. So my sort of sense, I mean, I'm very interested in ideas that come out of um, indigenous nations within settler states, you know, such as even notions around enoughness. So when we're thinking about um, sustainability, what is enough? You know, so that it, it sort of counters um, the whole notion around growth as growth. Well, thanks very much, Tracy. Um, so let's let's round out the 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 first. Um... Um, third of our, our session on on well-being, and move on to the the distribution um, portion. So a key theme running through the well-being report, Te Tai Wai Order, was how outcomes differ widely across different people, in, including that divergent experience between young and old, but across many 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 dimensions. Um, this was also a really strong theme in a lot of the presentations we had through our seminar series. So Stiglitz um, spoke about inequalities as a source of social stress. Sasha McMeeking from University of Canterbury and Romley Mokak from the Australian Productivity Commission emphasised the importance and challenges of bringing an Indigenous perspective to our, to our policy advice. We had seminars looking at the way in which subjective wellbeing can illuminate differences in what matters for wellbeing from John Halliwell. Um, and from Arthur Grimes, who's who's here with us today. Um, Paul Fritters and, and Christian Creekle from the London School of Economics showed us how the concept of subjective wellbeing could be operationalised in cost-benefit analysis. The Treasury did its own research for Te Tai Wai Order to explore the drivers of differences in life satisfaction uh, between people. The growing availability of data and new modelling techniques offered exciting opportunities to better understand the interconnections between different areas of wellbeing and how these differ across people. These types of insights could inform more effective policy interventions, especially those um, for those with, with poorer outcomes. And we did tend to find um, that outcomes were, yeah, there was a strong correlation across a wide range of, of uh, forms of wellbeing. Um, but yeah, now really keen to hear from a couple of panelists on uh, on issues to do with distribution, and then to continue the the conversation via the Q and A and and or among among the panelists and myself. So, I'm just going to ask individual panelists um, uh, a, a question or two, and then we'll and then we'll open it up to um, to to all participants later on. Um, so I'll start with you, Tracy. Um, how should we understand distributional differences in policy analysis and, and advice and what further changes are needed? Well, I think that, you know, uh, uh, we, we do a whole range of things trying to look at these distributional elements, you know, subgroup analysis and, and, and disaggregating data. Those are, you know, I think we do that and we've but it's important to extend that very, very significantly. And look, this morning I was at, you know, as I said, the growing up in New Zealand, uh, now we are 12 um, launch. And one of the really important elements in, in that is really the ability to, to do both quantitative and qualitative work, you know, really what Gail was talking about in ways that 
really create we, we, the sort of the nuance, the contours of the lives of these children. Because I think one of the incredible things around the growing up stuff is this is sort of real time. You know, they, this is Generation Alpha. You know, they're born 20, 2009, 2010. They'll be, re they'll be going into adulthood in the late 2020s. Yeah, so it's really significant. So, you know, one of the things that was released today is around cultural identity, around ethnic identity, around gender identity, and how significant and important it is for these 12 year olds, how they think and reflect about that. So, and the other one that came out was, you know, in regards to, um, you know, those living in forms of material deprivation. So I think there's something about dis about when you can really disaggregate data, that, that it's much more amenable to intersectional analysis. And so that is really significant and, and really around the richness of what's been said and the contours of, of that lived experience. So we need to be doing a lot more in, in a whole range of those places where we know we've got really embedded issues. Now, I talked about really early about this normalization of, you know, in many ways, you know, back in 2012, when uh, Jonathan and Boston and I were chairing the expert advisory group on uh, solutions to child poverty, one of the things that was really noticeable when we went around and talked to a whole lot of people was there was a very high tolerance for child poverty. People felt that if you sort of tried to, um, you know, mitigate some of the harms that you might reward bad parents. Now, I think there's been a real shift in that particular view, but it, it's an important element in regards to being able to use the evidence and data in ways that really is able to see that on the whole, the vast majority of parents were doing the best they could with inadequate income, inadequate resource, inadequate access to a whole range of types of facilities. If we look at things like disability and health conditions, this is another area where there's absolutely need to do distributional analysis to get more equitable outcomes. You know, what do we truly know about uh, people who live with health conditions and disabilities and the way that they are accommodated for within the welfare system or for that matter, within the labor force? So that we have a much better understanding around the types of flexibility that will be needed so that people can more fully participate and, and by participating, increase their well-being. So my last bit is around the need for distributional analysis because it holds, it holds people to account. It holds governments to account. It holds you know, funders to account. We can't just keep identifying these issues and then report after report noticing these poor outcomes. So there is that that element about you do this analysis, but it must be to ensure that there is action. So you can, you mustn't do this distribute. You know we must do this analysis, but the intent is for transformative change. Thank you very much, Tracy. Um, okay, one more question before we open up to a general Q and A, uh, and this one is for Gail. Um, Gail, this is about the key or what are the key uh, labour market disparities in New Zealand and what do you see as the priorities for further research to better understand the drivers of distributional patterns in New Zealand? Oh, thank you. Um, yes, in terms of labour market disparities, I mean, there's uh, quite a number that we could talk about, whether it be gender or ethnic uh, differences in occupation, industry, insecure work and so on. But I thought I might just focus on two particular uh, types that I think are important for different reasons in my uh, five minutes. Um, the first one is probably one everyone uh, has heard me talk about in a range of forums, uh, not just recently, but over many, many years. Um, uh, so you'll, but you hear me talk about it again, uh, pay gaps. Um, and this is because the research shows that despite all the differences in occupation, industry, et cetera, uh, when we try and account for that as best as we can in the empirical models, there still exist large unexplained gaps. And the reason I stress this particular disparity is because it has impact beyond the individual, right? This isn't an individual effect in terms of their lower wa wages, it's impacts on their whanau, their communities, and beyond that as well. So I think that's an important one to stress. Um, the second disparity that I wanted to kind of talk about, and I'll spend a couple more minutes on this one, is really, and it's not a labor market disparity per se, but I think it's really important to highlight, is our poor literacy and numeracy statistics for Māori and Pacifica in particular. Um, you, know, you know, if we look at PIAC data, uh, which is focused on adults, 
we know that over half of our Pacific population have low numeracy skills uh, and a third have low literacy. And the corresponding numbers for Māori are a third and a fifth, I believe. And if you focus on youth, if you think about the next gen generation coming through, uh, you know, these are 15 year olds in PISA data, uh, a fifth of this age group has low reading and or math skills. Uh, and Māori and Pacific account for half of this low skill group. Uh, and there's other reports, uh, UNICEF says a third of our 15 year olds have uh, below basic literacy and numeracy proficiency. Now this is, you know, this is really worrying because not only is it poor statistics, but they've also been worsening over time uh, in, in uh, recent stats. And the reason this is an important disparity to kind of focus on is we know it's linked with poor labor market outcomes as well as a range of other well-being outcomes later. So we did some research where we linked uh, literacy and numeracy skills at 15 and looked at the range of what were the life course trajectories of different groups based on their literacy and numeracy skill. Uh, so it's not a causal, but it's a, you know, looking at the associations of what are their life course patterns for these two uh, groups. And we did a number of rare, you know, outcomes, whether it be employment, uh, wages, uh, whether it be number of months of employment, et cetera. And you can see really clear divergent patterns from as early as your mid 20s between groups that have below a low skill uh, in literacy and numeracy versus those with a above baseline skill. And these associations don't just stop at labor market outcomes, you know, they traverse, we looked at what was the patterns in terms of hospital admissions, what was the patterns in terms of work related injuries for the next 10 years, criminal offenses and convictions. So this is it traverses a whole range of different aspects of people's lives, not just uh, in the labor market. So that's why I thought I'd point out um, that particular area that I think is one that we need a lot of attention to. And given those longitudinal disparities in literacy and um, numeracy skills, and also given that those are the populations that were more affected, uh, or the, pop sorry, let me rephrase that. The populations that are more affected in the space are the same populations that faced educational disruptions over the COVID period, right? So we need to give this a lot more attention in terms of research, funding for intervention and initiatives. I know there's a new literacy and numeracy roadmap strategy released at the end of last year, and there's ongoing pedagogy discussions in this place. So I think this is an area um, that needs some more attention. Now I heard my one minute ping, so I'll just mention one more point, um, I completely agree with Tracy, we need to do a lot more analysis and make sure we have the data for disaggregate analysis. Uh, sometimes sample size is small for this and we need to make sure we oversample priority populations. Like if you're thinking about the literacy and numeracy stats in the PX survey, the last time they ran it, they'd oversampled Māori but they didn't oversample other groups. And I know that they're addressing this in the next wave and they're going to also oversample Pacific and youth to get uh, big enough uh, populations that we can then do some analysis with. So I think that's uh, a really pleasing sign and I'd like to see more of that because we need the data uh, for the smaller groups as well to understand what's happening for those groups. Thank you. Thanks very much, Gail. Um, so just invite anybody um, online to submit questions to any of the four panelists on um, on this topic of of distribution. Um, I thought I might just start with a a follow up question for something that Gail mentioned, um, and then actually happy to open it up to any other panelist who wants to to comment after after Gail's had a had a go. But Gail, I mean, you, you talked about. Um, educational outcomes, how they're connected to labour market outcomes, and they're also connected to other forms of wellbeing, such as health outcomes. Um, but what about the the connections, the prior connections? So do, do you have a view on the causes of the disparate educational outcomes in New Zealand? Um, and actually, uh, the wellbeing report identified that New Zealand has um, a greater inequality of educational outcomes than a lot of countries we like to to compare ourselves to. Um, although it's improving due to a process of leveling down rather than leveling up. So the disparities are 
uh, not worsening, uh, but but because the the top is um, uh, yeah, it's leveling down rather than leveling up. But um, but Gail, I just I just wondered if you had thoughts on the causes of the um, of this disparate and um, deteriorating um, educational outcomes in New Zealand. Yeah, so I guess the first thing I might say there is that I've tried to separate out educational outcomes from literacy and numeracy skills because we're when we're thinking about, you know, we're not saying uh, a lot of times when I've talked about this in the past, a lot of people assume it's about making sure everyone gets to a particular uh, level at school or make sure they go on to tertiary education. It's not about that per se. It's about, you know, what I'm thinking about are, are those basic literacy and numeracy skills. So, you know, they are correlated you know, having the literacy and numeracy skills are correlated with the educational outcomes. But yeah, I'm thinking more about those particular basic skills. So, and when I talk about, say, for instance, that uh, over half of Pacific uh, fall below the, what the OECD level is of basic uh, literacy and numeracy, we're also talking about really low levels of, you know, being able to read a relatively short print and detect a single piece of information in it. You know, these are really low levels of literacy or numeracy tasks. We're not talking about making sure they go on to tertiary education, et cetera. So maybe that's just a thought. I'll just divorce those two things slightly, even though they're correlated. Uh, and I see Tracy's got a hand up too. <laughs> Tracy. Yeah, look, uh, there's a, a, two points I guess I really want to make. And one is when you can have systems that can have high quality, low equity um, outcomes. So you can have high quality systems and education may be one certainly it could have been seen that, you know, you still get some really high quality outcomes from our education system, but really, really poor equity distribution. So that's a really significant type of issue. The other one is that it really shows that real need for real nuance. Most of my work is within justice system, is within the criminal justice system, is within prisons. One of the absolutely, you know, in the 15, 20 years that I've been in prisons, largely working with young people who come into, into the prison system. And remember, in New Zealand, you can come in as young as 16 into an adult prison system. Um, overwhelmingly, if I look at those people between 16 and 18, and indeed between 16 and 20, who come into prison, overwhelmingly, they have been excluded from the compulsory education system by 13. The youngest that I've come across being excluded, formally excluded from the system is six. So it's not just around people coming into prison because they can't read. It's around real system failure prior to that, shaped by discrimination, shaped by racism, shaped by processes of marginalization. So yes, we have these, those, you know, but it's not just these are children that haven't learned to read. You know, it, it's because of this incredible rupture in their life and this, as I said, the systemic frustration of any aspiration that they may have. It shows the absolute urgency of the type of research that is able to, to pull out those types of contours into their work. And, uh, you know, so I absolutely agree with everything that Gail said. And it's just that sort of thing of really, really looking at if you're going to look at really embedded inequalities and, you know, the gross disproportionality within our criminal justice system, you know, globally, the gross disproportionality um, in, our, in our criminal justice system speaks to that type of urgency. Thanks very much, Tracy. Um, oh, Arthur's got his hand. Actually, I was going to, to ask you a follow up question, Arthur, but, but maybe I'll, I'll, I'll give you um, first right of reply. <laughs> Just to, no, I was just going to very briefly. I mean, we know that educational disadvantage is run strongly within families, uh, and so I think this is an example where policy needs to step away from the sort of silo mentality of just saying this is a problem with schools. Um, and, I, and I think of you know a really nice example of the Manaya Kalani uh, project in you know East you know Tamaki and, and and that surrounding area, where bringing computers into school didn't just address issues for the for the children, but also started addressing issues of literacy amongst the parents because parents would come along and then they would say they'd get the parents involved, even the parents, many, you know, some of whom were um, had poor or, you know, very poor literacy. But actually they would say, well, why don't you, why don't we get you in here so you know how to help your child? And then but essentially they were teaching the parents to read. And um, so I think, you know, we've, it's, and, you know, another example was, you know, um, 
uh, rheumatic fever. It wasn't a health issue, it was a housing issue, you know, these sorts of things. So policy makers really need to be thinking, for, especially for more um, communities that have multiple disadvantages, think about um, interventions right across the board, the board you know. If I could um, perhaps ask a slightly challenging question, though, Arthur, that um, you, your opening um, your opening talk sort of emphasised the ability of individuals to express what they think matters for their well-being. Um, does that conflict a little bit with what we're zeroing in on here? Um, educational outcomes matter for well-being very broadly, um, and there's a whole range of early objective evidence so objectively that that early on x y and z in fact matters for educational outcomes so does this sort of objective evidence on what does cause educational outcomes conflict with a sort of a um, individual driven assessment of what matters for well-being or, or how do you resolve that conflict i think it conflicts with who is who speaks on behalf of the child um, we're not going to ask the child what they, you know, would they rather have a lolly today or go to school or something like that. We're going to, you know, at the moment, we, we the question is, you know, how much control does the parent have, the community have, the, the state have, etc. We have compulsory education at the age of 16 for a reason, is that we don't trust some parents. Um, and uh, so, you know, there, and that's, you know, been the case for, <laughs> for the century or, or something. So, I think you know there is a case here where we say the parents aren't completely responsible for the child. The whole society has responsibility for the child. And now I think there was one or two hands sort of going up, or any other sort of further responses on this this topic. I might just add one really really quick comment. I mean, uh, I think the earlier the intervention, the better. We often, I guess, we normalise things to a certain point where we, it got, got passed on to the next person's problem or the, whether it's in the education in future years, we think that's the next teacher's problem or we think it's somebody else in the sector. You know, if it's outside of education, it flows through to other aspects of the, the public policy sector as well. So just the earlier, the better, because it, you know, it's, it seems that almost at 15, if you measure their lit literacy and numeracy or other educational outcomes that, then has a lot of, you know, it's harder to, the intervention becomes harder and harder. So I just wanted to emphasize that earlier part. Brilliant. Well, it sounds like we're, we're sort of zeroing in on this um, multifaceted and interconnected um, nature of, uh, of well-being across a range of domains, all sort of interconnected with one another and, and early intervention in, in the case of um, of educational outcomes. So um, I really think I really think these educational outcomes are just such an important topic across a wide range of um, of aspects of well-being in New Zealand. Actually, our new new series on productivity in a changing world. I think deteriorating educational outcomes has to be part of that as well. Um, uh, both both the productivity part and the changing world part, because um, uh, the emphasis of education and the importance and is going to change as the, as the world changes. So, thanks very much for um, for thoughts on on distribution, um, which zeroed in on education. Um, you know, I'm sure it could have zeroed in on a wide range of of um, of anchors really in in, in terms of, of of thinking in thinking about um, distribution. OK, the last um, third of our, our session I'd like to spend on future well-being. Um, we could also think of this in terms of the sustainability of what we know that well-being in, in most domains has improved over the course of the decades and centuries. Um, but we need to think about whether this is sort of sustainable over time. Um, Te Tai Wai Order highlighted that New Zealand yeah, has high aspects, high levels of many aspects of wealth, um, which enable us to sustain well-being. However, there is tentative evidence that we may be approaching biophysical limits, which could um, threaten our ability to sustain well-being. So, if if we live in a physical environment that um, whose uh, ability to sustain our well-being is threatened, well, that's a threat to future sustainability. Now, we didn't 
we didn't make predictions about whether New Zealand's well-being would or would not be sustained into the future. But one thing we did strongly emphasise is that society was g- going to have to make different choices. The economy was patently going to have to um, reform itself. For example, um, either emitting less carbon on a global scale or learning to live in a warmer world, or probably both, is something that we're going to have to do if we wish to sustain our well-being. So um, I guess what we were emphasising is that sustaining well-being and our ability to do so would depend on societal choices, um, as well as technology and productivity that might that might come along. So that's, that's one aspect that we emphasised in, in Te Tai Wai Order. Um, but an- another thing that, that we really emphasised is the need for better measures of a range of aspects of wealth, particularly the natural environment. Um, there are quite a few measures there, but we identified it, you know, a, a great, it's a, a real emphasis of our feedback to Stats New Zealand, actually. Uh, and social cohesion, there's really very little um, to go on there in terms of um, um, uh, statistics. We also need to better understand the risks around the environment's contribution to future well-being and um, the resilience of our institutions to respond to negative events. But I'm um, keen to hear from a couple of panellists on, on key issues for our future well-being, and I'll start with Arthur. Um, Arthur, what do you see as the most significant elements to consider in relation to issues of sustainability in New Zealand, and what work is needed to better understand how to respond to these challenges? Uh, thanks, Dominic. Um, let's think about uh, what sustainable means. Sustainable means that something is capable of being sustained. It's capable of of going on. It doesn't necessarily have to be, and it can be a, an announced policy path is capable of being sustained. It doesn't have to be a constant policy or a constant thing. It could be a, a policy that says we'll, we'll gradually run down resources over time of a particular resource, um, obviously. Um, certain resources, if you use them, they're going to be used up. Um, and there are ways of doing that sustainably. Um, hoteling showed that 100 years ago. Um, what we do have to understand, though, uh, not just whether a path is feasible, but we have to understand two separate points. One is one that you sort of just touched on a little bit in your introduction. One is that the Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment discussed very well in his report just before, well, late last year, which is thinking about where are the environmental tipping points for sustainability. That's absolutely crucial. These things aren't linear. As you approach certain areas, suddenly you can just go, you know, a huge change. So we've got to be really understanding where those tipping points are um, in terms of feasibility, because it's suddenly you could just be going what you thought was feasible is not. The more, not more important, but the other aspect that I really want to emphasise, though, is that sustainability is not just about feasibility, but it's also about incentives to maintain that policy. Um, so in economic parlance, we call this time consistency of a policy, that it has to be a policy not only has to be sensible to do now, but the incentive of decision makers has to be to stick with that policy in the future. So it's time consistent. And, and in other words, the policy is sustainable in a political sense, um, not just in a, um, in, a, in, a, in a theoretical sort of sense. Uh, microeconomists call this incentive compatibility. Um, and this is a huge emphasis um, of economists when we think about sustainability, that things have to be both feasible, but they also have to be time consistent for policymakers to stick to. Um, now, I think this is really important, and I think it's been incredibly underplayed in the work that's been done in recent times from Treasury and other sources in terms of um, thinking about sustainability and in, in, um, in the long term. There hasn't been enough thought given to the institutional structures designed to make sure that policies that are that looks that like they will lead to sustainable policies will be sustained themselves. Um, I'll give you two examples. One, um, when we, and, you know, the Fiscal Responsibility Act and the Reserve Bank Act 30 years ago were designed around time consistency principles um, because um, we knew that the previous a way of running monetary policy, for instance, was not time consistent. Once you added an employment target to an inflation target, it was no longer time consistent. People, the central bank would suddenly go away from targeting low inflation um, towards a short term objective for um, unemployment. You'd get inflation, you get asset price inflation. Of course, that's exactly what we've seen when that um, framework came uh, crumbling down five years ago, as we had massive asset price inflation with 
you know, house prices increasing 50 percent in, in a space of uh, three or four years and now tumbling 20 percent or so. Um, and of course, the well-being effects of that are huge. People have bought houses at massively overinflated prices, driven by a short-term um, target rather than a time-consistent target. And now people are losing their houses, either they're having to sell voluntarily because they can't afford mortgage payments um, or they're in mortgagee sales. That, and we know from the literature that having to let go of a house like that is terrible for well-being. Um, or the threat of having it is terrible for well-being. So we've ditched a time-consistent policy, one that was sustainable, for one that was unsustainable with huge negative well-being effects. Another example is the um, ETS, um, where um, we set up a, a, what looked like institutionally, like it was an, a, certainly an improvement of what we had before, setting up the Climate Change Commission. The Climate Change Commission then came up with really sensible recommendations of how we could make sure that the ETS um, worked in, um, to achieve New Zealand's carbon targets. We all know what these targets are. We all know what we have to do. I mean, it's not like there's any research that has to be done to say how much carbon do we have to reduce. We know we've got targets, right? What was what was lacking was having a time consistent policy to achieve those targets. So the Climate Change Commission comes up with some really sensible um, recommendations and they were then um, not adhered to by, by government and, and including the advice that was against it from, from officials. Um, and so we end up with gutting the ETS, which is our only real major policy for achieving climate change you know, <laughs> our targets. So we have these short term um, institutional arrangements which um, we know what we need to do on these things. We know we have to consistently target inflation. We know we have to consistently reduce um, carbon emissions through increasing the price of carbon. And yet the short-term incentives have not been designed uh, or have been taken away um, to, to, to just throw them away. So it's not an issue of understanding what is sustainable, what is feasible. It's, we know a lot of what's feasible and what's sustainable. We just don't have the institutional structure to keep those policies being maintained over time. And that's an emphasis that I think economics brings to the sustainability debate, which is not often brought by ecologists and others. They don't think about what's the incentives for policymakers. Uh, and so from a, that's the area that I would like to see more emphasis on, is how do we design institutions to achieve and to stick with policies that we know are going to be sustainable, if they are only stuck to? And I'll leave it at that. Thanks very much, Arthur. Um, sounds like we're getting to some very sort of foundational um, constitutional type um, uh, uh, issues there, which is, um, yeah, at the very heart of things. So, so thanks very much. Um, final question before we open it up. And I think we've got quite a few questions lined up in the um, in the Q&A section as well. Um, Les, um, just like to ask you, how do we improve our understanding of the risks to and the risks from New Zealand's natural environment? How do we, how also do we learn how to better manage those risks? Um, thank you. It's um, it's not surprising that Arthur and I have worked together, and we should have talked together before <laughs> before we started, because my 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 three headings here are timing, consistency, moral hazard, and adverse selection. And you let me let me build on what you've said rather than um, repeat what you said. And rather than talking about time consistency, I'm going to talk about time inconsistency and I'm going to relate it to um, some of the um, climate related and weather related issues that have cropped up around New Zealand. Uh, and um, for those of us that can remember being taught about time inconsistency in Kidland and Prescott, we know that um, um, time inconsistency will lead to uh, um, a situation where uh, the optimal policy will have to change um, in certain circumstances. And I think what has not happened in terms of local government and to some extent central government is that when people have built on the floodplain, um, there hasn't been uh, any attempt to create dams and levees to protect those citizens that have um, built on the dams and in, in that floodplain. And that's exactly what the time inconsistency uh, of optimal plans would suggest would be a necessary outcome. And what I'm saying here is in terms of understanding these risks, I think that there needs to be both from a planning perspective and from a higher level perspective, an, un an understanding of 
again, Arthur's used the word incentives, but in some sense, the, the incentives that are created by the institutions that are out there. And um, those institutions are often related to either central or, or local government. And both of them have very short time horizons. And it's sort of then going to lead me to disagree with some things that Arthur said previously about um, you know, the, the idea of representative governments and, and citizens uh, um, uh, groups where they will, themselves will have pretty short term perspectives on, on things. And it may well be, I think, that there needs to be some fundamental change in both the custodianship of some of these things um takitanga in a in a in a, in a maori perspective uh custodianship uh being taken away from uh representative governments in certain cases and i'm thinking here in relation to to um to air and water air and water are are, are, are fundamental elements of capital moving forward that are going to be um uh, both short term and in the long term, the drivers of sustainability. And um, um, in terms of uh, natural custodians of those, then they don't n naturally sit with uh, government because of the time and consistency argument. I think the other thing that um, so there, I think that there's uh, there's a definite need for institutional change about who is actually regarded as custodians of these sorts of, of sorts of these, these capitals. And in some of the work that I've been um, trying to progress with uh, my Maori colleagues and others, we've looked at the notion of um, legal person in terms of uh, um, land uh, ownership. And uh, um, we have a few examples in terms of the um, uh, Wanganui River and Tuho where uh, there the, the nature of the, the advocacy and the, and the custodianship has gone away from, um, from government. And that has a much longer perspective. The other thing I mentioned, because I think I heard a bleep then, is I think that we, we get far too carried away in this sustainable literature on the idea of focusing on non-renewables, non-renewables, non-renewables. And Arthur's mentioned, you know, hoteling and, and various other things. But we assume that renewables will continue to renew themselves. And climate change has told us that that's something that we ignore at our peril. And we, we really are taking renewables for granted moving forward. And non-renewables, um, I don't think there's anything that hasn't been solved by uh, markets. We had peak wood, we have peak oil, we've had peak coal. You know, those things will be solved. We, we, we'll have more of those non-renewables in, in the earth than we uh, probably use. But the renewables are something that we're taking for granted. And water and air is one of them. So I think one of the risks moving forward is that we continue to think that water and air are things that we can forget about. And in, in the work that we've been talking about, we call these critical capital. These are things that are that are not substitutable for any other form of capital. And they will be a binding constraint before anything else becomes uh, a constraint on sustainability going forward. I didn't answer your questions really, Dominic, but I mean, Arthur pinched a few answers and I think it was uh, it, it was useful to to carry on uh, these institutional discussions, which I think are pretty high level. Oh, we appreciate the uh, the comments nonetheless, Les. Um, very insightful and, and very, very interesting. And and I'm actually just amazed at the breadth of what we've traversed um, between the four panellists today, the, the, the various perspectives, um, not necessarily mutually exclusive, but certainly um, quite a range of, of emphases. Um, I do have a, there's a range of questions um, in the in the Q&A now, and some of them actually relate back to the um, the distribution um, section. Um, what I'm going to do is just pick one of them, and actually, I think it's sort of so fundamental. I'd I'd love to to hear a little bit from all four panelists, um, if we could just keep it brief, if 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 you wish. Um, so, kia ora all. Equity is a central aim of the health system, but why is it that 
equity is so hard to achieve in either health or education or social welfare when the evidence shows different treatment and resources are needed to address inequity, but this just does not seem to happen. Appreciate your collective wisdom. And I think um, uh, we'll start with uh, Tracy or Gail. Um, we were unmutes first, just because the other two have, have spoken more recently. So, Tracy. I mean, I would have. I, I look forward to what Gail's got to say on this one because I think she's got, um, a, you know, a lot to contribute in this area. But you know, it, it is a, it's a really important question. This is what I talked about when we said we can't just keep doing research that identifies the issue and then have no accountability in actively working to transform it. And so I think that that's a huge issue. And I think it does come back to something that both Arthur and, and Les have just talked about in their section around the types of constitutional transformation that might be needed to ensure that actually those poor outcomes for Māori Pacific and for others are addressed. And some of that is around the, const you know, and we've seen it with Matsuki Mai report, uh, we've seen it in the discussion document of He Pua Pua, in regard looking at different types of elements. So we've got this Kawanatanga space, the crown space, you know, we've got these places where we can work together, but the Rangatira Tanga space, the place where actually we see the seeding of power of the crown to allow um, a lot of that work to truly be done, to be resourced, but to be done by those communities. We can't keep saying the solutions are in the community and then ensure that they're not resourced and that they live with it. It is astonishing to me in talking about well-being that there can still be this broad tolerance that some people live, as I've said, in conditions of scarcity and deprivation and that that has been that there's an intergenerational component on it. So the normalization of poverty, you know, and the, it's naturalization, it's been made, it can be unmade, we can remake it. And I, I think that those elements, co-determination becomes really important, you know, that there may be places within that Kawanatanga space, it's not around co-design now, it's around co-determining a future and a, a, and, and a sustainable future at that. I'll leave it to Gail. No, uh, and I, I was going to say some really, really similar things. I think part of the problem is that normalization. I think I think that's a huge problem, that normalization. Uh, so I, I think it's worth emphasizing there. Um, I also think there is, you know, that, you know, as Tracy and others have pointed out, there's lots of good research happening. Uh, but part of the problem is not just that we don't do anything with it. it, it the research isn't connected. Uh, so, you know, one of the things we need also is researchers to work with uh, a lot more with practitioners, a lot more with directly with policymakers. Otherwise, there won't be anything that comes out of the research. It will happen. It will exist. And there's different incentives that lead research as well uh, within the country. Uh, and without it being connected directly with the with the policymakers and the practitioners, we won't get the actions out of it. Right. Thanks, Gail. Um, Arthur. Yeah, thanks. I'd just like to <clears throat> build on what Tracy has said. Um, I think, you know, a lot of words are said in politics um, across the political spectrum, but it comes back to my points in, 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 the, in the first part, and there's some concrete targets there to, uh, to achieve. Uh, the words seem to proliferate, but the actions don't. Uh, and I'll give you two examples where I think it has been um, some targets have been effective. One, Rheumatic fever and the better public services targets. That was one where, where a strict, you know, a really hard target was put up for a, in a particular limited time frame, and it wasn't met. And then, so the government then had to say, "Oh, okay." I mean, obviously, this is a group, you know, it's affecting especially Maori, and um, and it's like, okay, we're going to have to put more resources into it and different resources and think about how we're doing it because what we're doing now is not working. That would never have happened if they didn't have a target, a time-bound target. Um, a second one was COVID vaccination. Again, um, vaccination of Māori was really slipping behind, and it was only because there was explicit or implicit targets about getting people vaccinated. They suddenly said, oh, maybe we might have to get Māori providers <laughs> involved in vaccinating Māori and, and change, change it. If there hadn't been any sort of actual target to get people vaccinated, it wouldn't have happened. So just talking about equity, I think much of our um, uh, political space is, talk, is, is just words. We, we need actual um, targets, which then drives actions. Any perspective on that, Les, or should we? I, I, I'm just, um, Arthur's mentioned rheumatic fever twice, and I can remember the first response was from the science community, which said we need a vaccine, and we need to spend some money on a vaccine in New Zealand. 
And I think it just reiterates that, you know, just identifying an outcome does not necessarily identify the cause. And if, you know, if we'd followed that route, we still, you know, we wouldn't have dealt with the the, the, the housing issues, the, the, the poor quality health issues. And that what we need to do is to ensure that we, you know, we, we have a deep understanding rather than simply, I, I, I like the idea of targets because I think the last five years I've, I've sort of missed them. Um, but, um, you know, understanding the, um, the indicators and these sort of things aren't enough in their own right. And this is what always been a bit frustrating to me about the living standards framework. There's nothing under the hood, really. There's, there's no sort of real model of these interrelationships. Um, there's a whole bunch of indicators, but we, we, we need to think seriously about the drivers and some of the um, before we just look at the consequences. OK, thanks very much. What I'm going to do is combine a couple of questions, and I think Gail is the person I'm going to um, to pick on for an answer. It's around um, subgroups in the population, so it's, it's around data work. Um, uh, the first question is around geographic distribution. So well-being is often place-based, especially in a Te Ao Māori view. Um, and the question is sort of how is Treasury's well-being worked aligned with these regional and local communities? And, and we've got another question on um, on the Asian community in New Zealand uh, and you know policies that may or may not work for that community. So, so there's something here around. Um, well, I think data availability for subgroups across New Zealand, um, how we how we understand um, what's happening in regions, different groups of New Zealanders, and um, and and how we understand what what policies are going to need to be applied across those groups. Gail. Yeah. So I uh, I completely agree with the person who has ra uh, raised the question on uh, particularly migrants and Asians. I I think there isn't much. Uh, done uh, and we often don't look at the Asian subgroup uh, and also remember it's quite a heterogeneous group like we put a lot of different cultures into this Asian group uh, but it's also not looked at like uh, you know I talked a little bit uh, about um, uh, pay gaps before very briefly uh, and when we did analysis on ethnic pay gaps we looked at Maori Pacific and Asian pay gaps uh, and nobody has really uh, followed up or asked me more on the analysis we did on Asian pay gaps, which showed some glaring concerns. In fact, bigger pay gaps in terms of uh, much lower return for skill relative to their education levels compared to both Māori and Pacific. Um, and so I think, we, one, we need to do more uh, uh, analysis and we need to make sure we uh, get more data on uh, the different subgroups, whether it's migrants, whether it's Asians, whether it's by region, and think about who are our priority areas there and also don't put them all together into one because they are very different groups uh, and we shouldn't be thinking of these groups as uh, a collective uh, in some of the data work. Thanks, Gail. Um, there are quite a few questions now. I'm going to focus on the cyclone and flood as a reminder for us to rethink um, climate change policy, land use and resources, which will have impact on people's future well-being. What do you think we should focus on in this aspect? Um, I'll actually open that to the floor if anyone wants to raise their hand or have have first go at this. I don't know if I should have cursed go, but I just, you know, I, I just stepped into silence. Um, look, just one thing that I, I, you know, just around the significance of that, and I'm just going to go back to some of the growing up work because one, it, it sort of pulls on it does, you know, it's got Māori Pacific, it's got Asian uh, children in it. But one of the things is that what we were able to to see when we're looking at the data, and you know, I'm I'm not a part of growing up, but I do chair the steering group. Uh, for MSD um, uh, as the funder. And one of the things is that those children were Auckland and Waikato, but now you have 89 of children in their whanau in Northland, 45 in the Hawke's Bay with their whanau, five in Tarawhiti, you know, 135 in the Bay of Plenty. So we're able to do something immediately about looking at real life experience in real time of the way that the impacts of that of the extreme weather events 
have been understood by children, what it means in terms of transport, what it means in terms of health, what it means in terms of more educational loss. So what I, you know, what I, something I was talking about today was that the what it means for 12 and 13 year olds to experience that and that data to be collected right now, it's very likely to shape the way they think about climate change, shape the way they think about community response and institutional response and government response and what they think about recovery. So I guess what I'm saying in that is that we've got some real time stuff where we can learn from to inform and shape the way that we're going to that they'll need to respond to to a range of these issues. You know, these things are we know that natural or in different disasters are socially patterned. But I think that these again, it speaks both to that level of research and thinking and rethinking the way we think about positive sustainability. Kia ora, Tracy. Um, so I'm going to give the last words to, I think Arthur had his hand up fractionally before Les, so we'll go Arthur first um, and then last word to, to Les and we'll close after that. Arthur. Thanks, Don. We'll be trying to be quick. Um, this is probably the point that Les is going to make. <laughs> um, uh, I think what the cyclone experience has shown us is that we shouldn't rely on central government for responses, um, uh, you know, not only central government, nor should we rely just on local government. Um, the idea of localism, by the way, is not the way it's often painted by some lobby groups that it's about councils. It's actually much more local level than, than councils. And I'll give you one example. Quite a lot of my family live uh, in a beach community near Auckland. I won't say which one that has been very, very badly affected by um, by the by the cyclone. The roads were cut off. Um, they couldn't rely on the council to open those roads. The council was absent. Central government was absent. It was the locals that went, got their diggers out and started digging out the roads, digging out the slips at great expense and and, and danger to themselves. Um, but it was the local response and authorities have to realise and have to enable local people, not councils, local people to be able to respond to these things as part of the resilience side. I wasn't going to mention that one, Arthur, but what I will mention is that um, I, I think we, we're going to have a real um, tension between building back again in the same place and relocating people. And certainly relocating, you know, will have well-being effects which are significant in terms of breaking up communities and moving um, households. So I, th I think that's that's something that really I don't know where it sits with local central or uh, community areas, um, but also insurers and insurers need to you know, come come to the party on this one in a much better way than they did in Christchurch. OK, well, thank you very much, everybody. Um, as I say, we've had an incredible array of um, topics traversed today. Um, we've 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 traversed from the intricacies of um, sampling uh, uh, some populations of data right through to to deep constitutional um, um, issues uh, in time. We've journeyed from Adam Smith 300 years ago th right through to the, the cyclone and floods today. So this has been a truly all encompassing discussion, which is really appropriate for the for the nature of of well-being because one of the the key themes um, that came up in the distribution side was the the interconnected nature of of many aspects of of well-being so um a fantastic and and very wide-ranging um discussion I'd, I'd just like to to thank um the the four panelists for um for your time preparing for today and for for your time spent uh, um sharing your your views and your corridor today really appreciate it um um, and thanks to everybody who's who's joined us online today. And thank you. Actually, I, I'm presuming many people here have been with us through this journey as we put together the wellbeing report and the um, the online seminar series uh, around wellbeing. It's been a, a great experience for us, uh, and we certainly hope that that the the range of speakers and, and panelists that we've brought over time has been informative uh, for yourselves. Um, yeah, we look we look forward to to continuing uh, the conversations as we move to our new theme, productivity uh, in a changing world, and our, our first um, uh, seminar on that kicking off uh, later in the month. So let me um, close our seminar today and farewell you with a fakatoki. Um, this is a proverb that that talks about uh, discussion, learning, understanding, and knowledge underpinning well-being of of people. Uh, Marty Corridor. Kamohio, 
matemohio ka marama matemarama ka mato matemato ka ora te iwi homie huie taikie thanks everybody for attending uh, matewa